I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about what medications make ADHD worse. And this is the take-home message when I started researching it. There's almost no data. Searches on what medications make ADHD worse usually just bring up the side effects, the known side effects of stimulants and other ADHD drugs rather than addressing what are the drugs that might make your ADHD symptoms worse. Meditations seem to work by boosting dopamine or boosting norepinephrine levels. So you would expect the drugs that are dopamine blockers, like the antipsychotics and some digestive system medications, or on the norepinephrine system, drugs that block norepinephrine, like the beta blockers or the alpha-2 agonists, you would think those would be a bad combination for ADHD. But the evidence so far is they're not particularly worsening ADHD symptoms. Many of the medications that are most commonly used for people with ADHD are some that occasionally can worsen ADHD symptoms. So those would include stimulants themselves. It would include the benzodiazepines, the Valium, Adelian, and Xanax, clonopin-like drugs, and maybe the associated sleeping drugs like Ambien, and the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antidepressants. Most of the drug research is done by the drug companies. And they don't want to spend money looking at problems with their products. They want to promote and sell their products. If you're an independent researcher not connected with the drug company, you probably have limited money. You probably have limited time. You probably have limited lab space. You're probably much more motivated to research what is working for a given condition, not what causes problems or specifically what worsens the symptoms of the condition you're looking at. So what are we left with? We're left with sort of three channels of information we're left with. There are a few case reports of someone tried a certain drug and got this unexpected side effect. Now, again, even there, that case report is much more likely to be reported or written up if it had a beneficial effect. So when with the mantadine years ago was an antiviral medication, one that was given to some people with Parkinson's, disease and it treated effectively their Parkinson's, that was newsworthy, that was article-worthy, that got attention. If it caused bad symptoms or mimic some other disease, then it probably would get less attention and be less likely to report it. So secondly, the source of information on this topic is theoretical concerns. If our theory is that what's good for ADHD is boosting dopamine and boosting norepinephrine, and you would think on a theoretical basis, any drug that shuts that down or dampens it down, dopamine blockers, norepinephrine receptor blockers would be bad for ADHD. And then the other source of information I could find was, in addition to my own sort of clinical observations over the years, what people are reporting in online chats. And there, there was much more observations and complaints. I'd say the thing to remember is that People who are going online to chat about a problem are not a representative sampling of people taking a drug. They are specifically the people who most of the time had a problem, an issue, and want to share about it, want to share whether anyone else knows whether there's a result or a cure or an approach for this. But if someone's perfectly content and happy with their meditations, much lower desire for them to report things in an online chat group. Single class of drugs that I've found most commented on Reddit, what I've seen in my own practice, and a few studies that have written up are the stimulants actually are drugs that get the most attention for causing or worsening ADHD symptoms. Now, to put that in a framework, they are also the drugs that clearly, actually not just the drugs, the treatment approach of any type that has the biggest database supporting their efficacy for ADHD. They help to a greater extent than any other approaches I'm aware of, and they help a greater percentage of people. So saying that stimulants can sometimes worsen ADHD has to be taken in the context that more often they're helping with ADHD. Also to point out, when we're talking about stimulants hurting or worsening ADHD symptoms, we're not talking about the known negative side effects, most of which are uncommon, but some of them are pretty serious of causing stimulants do have potential for addiction. I have a YouTube talk on that. Stimulants have the potential for causing psychosis. I think that's one of the most serious and underreported possible outcomes. Cardiac effects can be serious and maybe even fatal from stimulants. So what we're talking about 
are situations in which stimulant medications seem to worsen focus, worsen concentration, maybe sometimes replicate or worsen the whole range of ADHD symptom clusters. So stimulants sometimes make people more scattered or inattentive, even though measurably they have a beneficial effect most of the time. And there's certainly lots of anecdotal reports and some studies showing stimulants can make some individuals more impulsive, aggressive, even though at a group level and at therapeutic dosages, they usually decrease those ADHD symptoms. So I think most of the time when we're looking at stimulants worsening ADHD or making ADHD symptoms more severe, stimulation shows a U-shaped function. So you need the right amount of stimulation to function well. If you're unstimulated, you're not motivated. If you're flat, you're bored, you're not doing anything. The right amount of stimulation helps. If you go too far and get too much stimulation, even someone with ADHD can be overactivated, revved up, and shows up as jittery, scattered, impulsive. I would say it's almost always a therapeutic dosage issue, that those are all signs that are too much, and that often if someone slides back down to a lower dose, those are not problematic side effects, and they do get benefit from the medication they thought was making things worse. And this always sounds a little pejorative, although we have you know, documented evidence, people with ADHD are not as good at monitoring their own ADHD symptoms as, for example, someone with diabetes might be accurate in recording their symptoms. So ADHD itself affects attention, affects concentration, affects working memory, and I'd say moderately often. Someone with ADHD is more aware now of how often they are having people off in conversation, or they're more aware of that they're tapping their feet during a team meeting. And because they weren't paying attention before, they thought, oh, well, I hardly ever did that before. Or maybe they think I never did it before, but now I'm doing it. That's a problem. So sometimes it's that people are doing better and are more focused, more attentive, less scattered, but they are more aware of what they're doing and their report of what they're doing, therefore, is skewed and makes it look like things are getting worse. And again, very little research on this topic that can make ADHD symptoms worse. One is sort of a simple, straightforward, and that's anything that's really sedating affects your ability of your central nervous system to be alert, focused, attentive, responsive, make decisions, plan. So particularly in this day and age where we hardly ever use barbiturates or some of the other classes of older sedating drugs, this is usually the benzodiazepines. So things like Xanax, Valium, Clonopin, Ativan. I don't usually like this as a combination of drugs, but there are a number of people who come to me on both a benzodiazepine and a stimulant and feel that that's actually helping them function well with both their anxiety and their ADHD. And then the third class of prescription drugs that gets the most attention in terms of interfering with ADHD. And again, some of this is that we're largely looking at psychiatric medications, not that other class of medications can't cause it. And it's the SSRIs, good for addressing depression and anxiety. For many people, they're a wonderful combination with stimulants if they are dealing with depression or anxiety. But for some people, particularly some people with ADHD who are used to their anxiety being an important motivating factor, driving them to do things, they feel less anxious, they may be less motivated. Some people at particularly high doses of SSIs are feeling sedated or dopey, usually not at standard doses, although very somewhat among the SSRIs. Usually high doses in long periods of time or some people who have an apathy syndrome, so are just separate from whether it's helping with anxiety or not, or just they're not caring, they're not motivated, and that can wind up interacting and making ADHD symptoms work worse. Other thing, and this is not a prescription drug, although it depends what state you're in, I guess, is marijuana and marijuana on the surface. What we can document most consistently in people who are using substantial daily doses of marijuana, marijuana is associated with poorer short-term memory, poor organization of thoughts, and lower motivation, which is a really bad combination, you would think, for most people with ADHD. So I've certainly seen some people who marijuana worsened their ADHD, but I also have seen some people who actually got better, and a few who feel it's the best medication for them 
I do have a whole nother talk in this channel on marijuana and ADHD. We have drugs that are dopamine blockers, that's like antipsychotic medications. And we have stimulants, which are dopamine booster. Like those just working directly in opposition to each other. I should add that there's a few other dopamine blocking agents, and most of them are gastrointestinal agents, things like regulam or metoclopramide, individuals who are on dopamine blocking antipsychotics and stimulants at the same time. Most of them don't seem to complain that their ADHD got worse. So maybe it's that the drugs for schizophrenia are working primarily on one subsystem and the drugs for ADHD are working in a different area. Since the early days when we thought there was just a dopamine receptor, we now identify at least five main classes, D1 through 5, dopamine receptors. Some of these are presynaptic, some are postsynaptic. Maybe these drugs are having different effects on different receptors in the dopamine system, and that's why we're not seeing what we would expect, which is direct opposition. Dopamine four main systems, the mesolimbic system, which has cell bodies, dopamine cell bodies in the ventral tegmental area and radiate the striatum, particularly the nucleus accumbens. That's a system that's strongly involved in reward, in the salience, the importance of stimuli and pleasure and reinforcement and therefore addiction pathways. You have the mesocortical pathway and some, some merge mesocortical and mesolimbic, mesocortical limbic starting in the same central basal area of the brain, the ventral tegmental area, and radiate into the prefrontal cortex and primarily are involved in executive functions. And we have the nigra striatal pathway where the cell bodies and the nerves are in the substantia nigra out of the striatum and radiating to a different part of the striatum, the dorsal striatum, the caudate and putamen. These are the cells that degenerate in Parkinson's disease. This is the pathway that's important for initiating movement, but also is involved somewhat in reward processing and conditioning. And then the fourth, smallest pathway is on the tuberin undibular dopamine pathway, where the cell bodies are in the hypothalamus. The short pathway just reaching over to the pituitary, mostly for regulating prolactin. Even though maybe antipsychotics are working more strongly on the mesolimbic system and for ADHD, our dopamine agents boosting it are working more strongly on the mesocortical system. There isn't a clear cut separation of pathways. And although, particularly the early antipsychotics, their strength in working as antipsychotics is proportionate to how well they bind to the dopamine 2 receptors. Most of these are having effects on dopamine 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 receptors as well, maybe at a weaker level. And even though Stimulants seem primarily to work on dopamine 1 and 2 receptor activation. We don't have separation either on a neuroanatomical level or on a receptor pathway level. More complicated dopamine theory is that we have two types of dopamine release. We have tonic ongoing low levels of release for dopamine that goes on in the human brain. And then with response to stimuli that you want to direct your focus or attention to, there's what's called a phasic burst, so a phase on top of a conic ongoing tone. And this phasic burst provides information about what to attend to, what to go, what's rewarding, whatever that dopamine system's involved with. And we know the dopamine system has these cool neurofeedback loops. It's a negative feedback loop. The cell that's releasing the dopamine into the synapse also has receptors for dopamine where it's just released dopamine and it auto receptors, the lower your tonic level of firing results in larger bursts of activation when there's something salient, important, worthy of attention in the environment. And the opposite of the case, if there's something in a given individual where there is a higher tonic resting level of dopamine, and when there's something salient in the environment, there's actually a smaller activation firing of these neurons. So the hypothesis, and there's substantial data to back it up, although this is clearly an oversimplification in itself, is that in ADHD, the level of release tonically is too low. And when something salient comes up, there's too big a peak, person becomes overwhelmed, flooded, over-responds. So this explains why they're both distracted at baseline and maybe hyper-focused when too much is coming on. So it reflects that the problem isn't just 
needs more dopamine is that there's a problem of both too little and too much dopamine. Stimulants do increase the tonic rate of dopamine release. They bring it up, which is what we would want them to do. And that means also through the negative feedback loops that when there's a phasic stimuli going on, it's not as catastrophically high. Now, schizophrenia isn't just the mirror image of the opposite. There's evidence that in schizophrenia, and certainly we're looking at glutamate and other receptor systems more now, antipsychotics through blocking dopamine receptors and through postsynaptic blockade and feedback loop cause an increase in tonic dopamine regulation. And the interesting thing is that the longer term postsynaptic effect on dopamine receptors is there's actually upregulation. So you have more dopamine receptors on the postsynaptic end. So you become more sensitive over time. That's probably part of how some of the bad side effects like cardiac dyskinesia or antipsychotics develop. Unfortunately, again, I have not much data and to sum it up is drugs you would think most likely should be avoided completely in ADHD are probably not drugs. So there is evidence that beta blockers can actually help or enhance at least certain emotional explosivity other ADHD symptoms in people who are on stimulants or not. I hope you all stay healthy and happy. 